My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Monday, March 14th, 2011, and I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, interviewing Donna Shirley. This interview is being conducted as part of the inductees of the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame Oral History Project. Donna Shirley was inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame in 2003. Thank you for joining us today. You're quite welcome. Well, Donna, let's begin by telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, let's start with your early life. Okay, well, I was born in Pauls Valley, Oklahoma, and uh, grew up in Winniewood. I guess I lived the first two years of my life in Pauls Valley. And then uh, my uh, father went into the Navy during, during World War II kind of late in World War II, and uh, we moved to Seal Beach, California, so my mother moved us there in the hope that if he ever got a, a leave, she could actually get to see him, and I think she get to, did get to see him once or twice. And uh, my sister was born uh, in Winniewood, but she was, we took her, we took her with us and, and to, Los Angeles, so Seal Beach, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. And um, that was really uh, pretty neat. I, I went to a really good uh, preschool there and then uh, went into, um, we moved to uh, San Jose, where my father set up a medical practice. And then he, uh, Got a call from my grandmother that she was not doing well, she was ill, and he needed to come back to Winniewood and take care of her, so he did. And uh, which is kind of a shame because we lived in a really neat place in San Jose. I can still remember it was on a, a fairly large house with lots of fruit trees around, and I would climb the fruit trees and eat, eat fruit. And um, so that, then I grew up the rest of my uh, life up till graduation from college in Winniewood, Oklahoma, which is in South Central Oklahoma, at population 2,500. And uh, so I don't know what to say about that, except that it was, it was an interesting experience you know, growing up in this very tiny town. Uh, but I was always interested in flying and in airplanes from the time I was, I can remember. And when I was 15, my father got me flying lessons for my 15th birthday. So I went out to Paul's Valley and learned to fly, uh, which was really kind of neat. So that later when I went to the University of Oklahoma, I took flying lessons and got several uh, pilot's ratings at OU. <clears throat> Let's see, in Winniewood, um, my mother was the uh, chairman of the Red Cross, uh, the Garvin County Red Cross um, uh, water safety program. So from the time I was 10, I taught swimming to little kids and got my um, water safety instructor's rating when I was 17 by lying about my age, because you're supposed to be 18. Um, so since then, I haven't done much swimming. <laughs> You know, you do it and then you get kind of tired of it. And since I graduated from college, I didn't do much flying or any flying at all because my father stopped paying for it and I couldn't afford it. So I took up instead, when I ended up in California, I took up skiing and hiking and things like that. Well, well growing up in, in Winniewood, outside of going to school and, and flying later, when you were really small, what did you do for fun? Well, uh, actually it was, was fun because such a tiny town, you knew all the kids. <clears throat> and so, uh, and in those days, your parents would say goodbye in the morning and you'd go off and come back in the evening for dinner and uh, nobody worried about where you were. So we, you know, played a lot and just, did things that kids do. We had a swing, a tree swing. There was a, a creek nearby that we weren't supposed to go into, but we did. And uh, just general kid stuff. Um, and when I was 10, I got into the band. 
because I was really too young to be in the band, but they needed an oboe player. And in those days, the only people who played oboe and bassoon were people whose parents had enough money to afford to buy them an instrument because the school couldn't afford oboes and bassoons and you know exotic instruments like that. So I started playing the oboe when I was 10. But you can't play the oboe in the march. And so I played uh, cymbals and then I played snare drum uh, all the way through high school. Uh, I was too klutzy to play basketball, <laughs> so I didn't do any sports. And basketball was the only girls' sport that we had in, in school. Um, I did a lot of, uh, I was in Girl Scouts. My mother started a Girl Scout troop specifically for my sister and I. And uh, then uh, we did a lot of uh, church activities. I was very active in uh, the Methodist Youth Fellowship in those days, which, you, you know, everybody was active in their church group. And so that was, uh, that was also something that kept us pretty busy. And then I read a lot. I read a lot of science fiction, and I built model airplanes and hung them from the ceiling because I was still very airstruck. And uh, what else did we do? You know, lots and lots of chores. And then fortunately, I lived in a little town of 2,500 people and both sets of grandparents and a great aunt and uncle and uh, an aunt, another aunt and uncle lived within three blocks. And so I spent a lot of time with my great aunt and uncle who were my favorite. My great aunt was my favorite person in the world, although she and I weren't really related, but uh, you know, she, was, she was great. And, she, we read and, and uh, I would go over there and read Collier's magazines and she um, taught me to sew and cook and uh, so, you know, you did all the, the normal things plus some weird things like building airplanes. <laughs> well, what were your, your schools like? Were they large schools, small schools? Oh, in a town of 2,500 people, are you kidding? Uh, the high school was 150 mm -hmm. kids. And my graduating class was 49 kids. Wow. And I was the valedictorian, whoop de doo of a class of 49 kids, uh, which wasn't very difficult. It, it was, you know, a very small school. Uh, but we had, you know, we had the, the requisite Oklahoma stuff. We had a football team and a, and a band and and uh, some of the kids played in the football team on the football team and then played in the band and uh, at other times because there just weren't enough kids to to go around um, i did not take um, home economics i was the only girl not to take home economics i took mechanical drawing in in school because i was really interested in engineering kinds of stuff and i wasn't at all interested in home economics <laughs> But uh, and I, was, I was a little weird. Favorite subjects? Oh, uh, favorite subject was actually English. Mm -hmm. An excellent English teacher. And we did a lot of, uh, you know, reading Shakespeare and things like that. And I really loved it. Um, I was pretty good at everything except typing. I made uh, two B's in high school. One was in typing and one was in algebra two. And I was just absolutely a klutz. You know, mechanically, so uh, it. Uh, I didn't do too well at typing, and then, I, like I said, I got a B in algebra too. So I ended up without a without a perfect 4.0 when I graduated, 3.8 something. So you could go to school anywhere, yet you decide to go to college at OU. And and why did you go to OU? Ah, good question. Well, we actually went and looked around at number of colleges and I wanted to go into engineering. Oh, when I was 10, I should mention, when I was 10, my mother took me to my uncle's graduation from medical school. And on the program, it said aeronautical engineering. And I asked my mother what that was. And she said, that's people who build airplanes. I said, well, that's what I want to do. And so uh, I looked at, uh, well, my family looked at uh, MIT and Georgia Tech and places like that. But 
MITs, we got to, we got to, I'm a country girl. <laughs> we got to MIT and it's in a city, you know, and it's big. And I'm sort of going, ooh, <laughs> this doesn't look very good. And the same thing with uh, Georgia Tech, you know, it's in the middle of Atlanta. And so we ended up with, uh, let's stay a little closer to home. So I went to OU, uh, which worked out fine because I'm sure I would have flunked out if I'd tried to go to MIT or, or Georgia Tech. And in fact, I nearly flunked out the first uh, semester of my freshman year. No, the second semester of my freshman year, uh, because it was, you know, it was really hard. I mean, this kid from this little tiny school, like we had chemistry, but we didn't, our textbook was written in 1929. And we had no lab and we didn't have physics we didn't have anything like that. And, and the thing is that I test well. So when I went to college and took all these entrance exams, I scored really well, just because I know how to take multiple choice exams. And so they put me in these advanced classes that I was nowhere near ready for. And so I was really struggling. In fact, my parents at, at eight weeks into school got red cards, which means your daughter is in danger of flunking. And they just, you know, went bananas and said, well, can we get you a tutor? What can we do? I said, no. So I went home over Christmas vacation and just studied and studied and studied and studied. And ended up with a B average. But I was completely unprepared for it. Uh, in chemistry, fortunately, one of my sorority sisters uh, was a brilliant. And I was, a, she was my lab partner. <laughs> so she got me through chemistry. <laughs> Uh, and that was that was the only thing that saved me. So I got through with uh, good grades until my junior year, and then I got engaged, and my grades went from a 3.5 one semester to a 1.2 <laughs> next semester, and <coughs> it was <coughs> it was quite bad. Well, I take it there were lots of women in your classes. Oh no. No, of course not. I was always the only woman in, in any of my classes. And in fact, in the whole College of Engineering, I think there were like five or six women. Um, but, uh, and in fact, one of the reasons my sorority pledged me was because they expected me to help their grades. They were a little hurting for grades at the time. And so they, you know, I was a closet case. I mean, I was really... I was a year, I was a year, two years younger than everybody else, because I started school when I was five, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, and I was a slow developer. I was a slow developer physically and a slow developer socially, and uh, you know my face didn't work right, <laughs> my jaw was too big and things like that, and I had this frizzy uh, hairdo, but uh, one of the women in the sorority was a pilot. And she found out that I was a pilot. She said, you know, we have to pledge this woman. <laughs> so they did. And she turned out to be a super good friend, still a good friend to this day. Uh, at Genora, her name is Janora Jessen, and she lives in Boise, Idaho. So you continued to fly throughout college? Yes, I took, um, uh, in fact, <laughs> I nearly flunked out. One of the problems I had the first semester of my freshman year was I went into my advisor's office and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to major in aeronautical engineering. He says, girls can't be engineers. And I said, yes, I can. And so he signed me up for, you know, 16 hours of regular classes plus three hours of flying. Now, for flying, you had to drive out to the airport Fortunately, I had a car and to drive out to the airport, spend the time, you know, flying and drive back, find a place to park and so on. Uh, so it was, uh, it was, it was a little tough. That's why I was having so much trouble the first semester of my freshman year because I was just overloaded. And I'm sure it was because this guy was trying to flunk me out. Mm. <clears throat> but he didn't succeed. <laughs> well, you got engaged. Well, that was my junior year, and, and flying-wise, I uh, got my pilot's license. I started to learn in Falls Valley, mm. and I wasn't old enough to get a license by the time I graduated from high school. So in college, I got a 
a private pilot's license, and then I went on and got a commercial uh, rating, and then in Stillwater, which is where you're mm -hmm. working, uh, in the summer they had a, a seaplane course. And I went up there and took the seaplane course. Well, the seaplane course is really interesting because there's a lake called Lake Carl Blackwell near, near OSU. And we learned to fly in this little Piper Cub on pontoons. And a Piper Cub is a very small plane. And it had these great big pontoons. And so we charged down the lake. And the only way we could get off the water was to lean up like this and get one pontoon off and then pop the other pontoon off. It was, it was pretty hairy. Anyway, so I got a seaplane rating. Then one summer I went to Illinois and got a multi-engine rating. And then I got a flight instructor's rating. So I was, you know, I was chock full of, of airplane ratings. So what, what did you hope to do with all of this great knowledge? You, you're quite the pilot now, you're going through school. So what's going on? Well, uh, partly, originally, I wanted to get my degree in aeronautical engineering and then, you know, go work for a company that built airplanes. And for a while I considered being a flight instructor. But uh, I had two students, one of which owned his own Piper Cub and he, I could never get him to learn to land. I spent, I probably spent 20 hours with the guy. And we'd come in, uh, you know, we'd come in and get closer and closer. I'd say, okay, Mr. So-and-so, back on the wheel, back on the wheel, back on the wheel, back on the wheel. <laughs> He'd just freeze, driving right into the ground. So after 20 hours, I told him he should go get another, a different instructor because I obviously wasn't going to do him any good. My second student was a kid who owned his own uh, Taylor Craft, which is a little little 65 horsepower uh, airplane, and he uh, was actually very good. And we uh, taught him down at a little grass field down you know, somewhere a little bit south of here, and he was really good. And so I was able to solo him very early. But on his first solo flight, he. He got off the ground and he went up and started around and the a front a little front came through and the wind changed direction. Now you have to land into the wind, but now he was coming in with the wind behind him and this was a very short field. And there was no way, I was down there waving, you know, but he couldn't see me. And so he came in and I was like, oh my gosh, he's gonna overrun the runway and crash into the trees at the end and so on. But he didn't, he was really good. He, he put it on the ground and stuck it there. But after that, I decided, you know, I don't think flight instructing is really my thing. So I, uh, about this time, uh, I was engaged and I was completely burned out in the engineering school. Just, you know, overloaded and I was in love. And uh, he was also kind of burned out. He was majoring in, in petroleum engineering and a uh, very smart guy. And he, he decided he wanted to be a doctor. So he was gonna change majors and go to medical school. I was gonna change majors and major in something that I could get a degree in very quickly and then put him through medical school. Well, the thing I could put him to could get a degree in very quickly was professional writing. So I changed my major to professional writing and loaded up 22 hours a semester uh, to, to get my degree quickly and uh, ended up with a degree in professional writing and, and then about halfway through my junior year or maybe my senior year I suddenly realized that what Johnny was interested in he wanted to get married and have kids and his fondest dream was sitting on his front porch watching his grandchildren come in. And it finally occurred to me, you know, hey, I'm not even 21 years old yet, and that's not what I want to do with my life. I want to do something more interesting. And so we split up. And uh, so he, he went off, and I think he ended up with a degree in chemistry and ended up owning a ceramics factory somewhere in Dallas. So at any rate, um, 
that went, uh, <laughs> didn't go exactly the way I planned. But as just to fill in the, what happened then was I graduated with this degree in, in professional writing and applied for a job and could not get a job anywhere. In fact, I only had one job interview. And this guy uh, was a young fellow and he said, well, let me take you up to my hotel room and we'll discuss this. We got up there, well, it was clear that he had other things in mind other than this job interview. So I was sort of, okay. But it turned out I got an offer from McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis uh, to be a specification writer. And that was the only offer I got. So I ended up going off to St. Louis and being a specification writer. But uh, in the meantime, I did graduate, had, had a degree. But after a year working as a specification writer, I realized what I really wanted to be was an engineer. So I went back to school, OU and finished the engineering degree in a year. And uh, then I went to work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And how did that come about? Well, that came about because I was um, at McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis, just hated St. Louis. World's worst weather. Just absolutely terrible. I hope you're not from St. Louis. No, I am not. <laughs> uh, world's worst weather. It's just miserably cold and slushy and snowy in this winter and hotter than blazes and humid. I mean, you think it's humid in Oklahoma. It's really humid in St. Louis because it's right at the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Uh, and the people are very unfriendly. It's a very clannish town. Uh, and so I didn't have any, didn't have any friends. It was six months before I had a date. And uh, finally one of the secretaries invited me to be part of her bridge group. And so then all of a sudden I was in with her social scene and, and had friends. So that was better. But when I went back to, uh, to St. Louis, I said, well, I want to be an engineer now. I don't want to be a spec writer. And the guy who was my boss said, oh, no, you're the best spec writer we've got. You, I won't transfer you. So uh, just at that time, da -da -da -da, a letter came around from the vice president of McDonald and said, I understand people are being denied transfers. And so this will cease. So I took that letter in and gave it to the guy. And he, Okay, so he, he transferred me to the aerospace engineering department and I worked on uh, Martian entry vehicles. So you, f you fly in and you come in and the front end of the vehicle has to be blunt enough to slow you down. So it's shaped like a sort of a coolie hat with a round, a round top. And it can't be too blunt or it won't be stable. It'll waggle around too much and it can't be too pointy or it will, won't slow down enough before you hit the ground. So I studied, my job was to look at the, the whole entry system and process and how that all works and how, what shape the, the uh, blunt sphere cone entry body could be. And, but I was still in St. Louis. So about that time, uh, I saw an ad in the paper from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena said, we're looking for aerodynamicists to work on Martian entry vehicles. Hot dog. So I wrote them and said, you know, I'm very interested in this job. And they said, okay. And they sent me a telegram saying, uh, okay, come out and interview with us. And so I was just ready. They had, I had the reservations all made and everything. And then <clears throat> an airline strike happened. So they uh, said, they sent me a telegram saying, well, you can't come because we can't guarantee you an airline ticket. So I went down to the airport, got on standby, flew out to Pasadena, <laughs> flew out to Los Angeles, checked into the hotel that they had for me already planned, uh, and called up the guy who was going to interview me and said, I'm here, do you want to interview me? And he said, ah, ba -da, ba -da. <laughs> Okay. So I had this job interview, and it was very tough. Uh, JPL is very picky about who it hires. And at that time, it was a, there were a dearth of aerospace engineers. So I had several job interviews, and they were all, oh, this is the desk you're going to be sitting at, and here's the perks we can give you, and so on and so forth. But 
and JPL gave, made me an offer, but it was the lowest offer I had. But I thought, you know, gee, it's so great to be in a place like this that I accepted and drove out to Pasadena in August which in a little tiny sports car, which was pretty grim, <laughs> over the desert, no air conditioning, and uh, went to work at JPL and stayed there for 32 years. And you had quite the career there. Well, it was interesting. I yes. mean, quite the career. And I know it's probably too many to name, but could you go through some of your, your the key moments while you were working at JPL for okay. me? Okay. Uh, well, I started out working on this aerodynamic entry problem, and uh, the and what JPL. Uh, well, originally I had written JPL because McDonnell Aircraft was going to propose on a project to land on Mars in 1971. The project was called then called Voyager, and uh, so. I figured, well, if I, go, and JPL was going to be managing that project. So I thought, wow, if I work for JPL, even if McDonald doesn't win, I'll get to, to work on this project. So that was the project I was working on and studying how blunt the blunt sphere cones could be and doing wind tunnel tests at Langley in Virginia. And, you know, it was really pretty exciting stuff. Um, and then they canceled the project. Congress canceled the project. Now this happens all the time. I mean, it just happens all the time. And so uh, somebody had to get laid off and I was the junior person in the group, so I got laid off. Uh, and I found a job at a tiny company in Pasadena uh, who, who did um, aerodynamic studies of various and sundry kinds and went to work there. And uh, they were working on a project to, originally, I was attracted because they said they were going to be studying dolphins and how dolphins swam and why dolphins could swim so fast and so on. Well, that's, that's fluid dynamics. And then um, I got crosswise with the, the owner of the company because I wouldn't falsify my results so that, he would, so that they would look good. Uh, and so... He demoted me, I mean there were only 10 people in the company, he demoted me to being the uh, proposal writer. So my job every day was to get up and open the commerce business daily and look for a proposal and write a proposal. Well, the chances of, <laughs> of a single person writing a proposal and actually winning it are zero. Uh, which was pretty bad, but in the process I found out a lot about the previous history of this company and I found out that he basically made a career out of cheating the government. So, you know, he went from the, from the Army to the Navy to the Air Force. <laughs> and uh, also it became clear that uh, there was a time when he, he went out with a, one of his sponsors and took me along and went to this nice restaurant in Los Angeles. And it became clear through the evening that he somehow expected me to be <laughs> a hook for this guy. Fortunately, the guy was a very nice guy, didn't try to take any advantage of it at all. And so I thought this was really terrible. But when I found out that he was doing all this, you know, falsifying travel funds and all that sort of stuff, so I went into his office and said, I quit. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, I don't like the way you do business. And so he wrote me out a check and off I went. So then I had no job. And so I, but I had friends at JPL. So I called my friends and I said, you know, I have no job. Is there anything open at JPL? Fortunately, there was a, a guy uh, who ran a group that did advanced studies looking at, you know, kind of far out stuff. And so I went up for lunch with him and he said, well, uh, he said, well, your background doesn't fit this very well. He says, but you're really smart, so you could probably do it, so I'll hire you. So he did. So, uh, <coughs> so I was working on this, this study to look at uh, flying from one planet to the other and flying through the atmosphere like a Venus to get to Mars to slow down and go in the right direction. And it was so boring. 
And my office mate was working on a project to uh, develop an automated drug identification machine. Now this is in the 60s, so drugs were just starting to be this big deal. And he was bored. He loved what I was doing. So we went to the supervisor and said, can we change jobs? And he said, can you do that? And we said, why not? He says, okay, so we changed jobs. So I, next thing I worked on was this automated drug identification machine. So I got to go around to crime labs and medical labs all over the country, looking at how they analyzed, uh, for, analyzed urine samples and blood samples and just drugs for, for drugs. And uh, finally determined that there was just no way that we could actually build uh, a machine or a system that would do the job for what was affordable by these, by these labs. So that didn't work out too well. Well, in the meantime, uh, I was dating a guy and his roommate uh, was in charge of um, uh, mission design for the Mariner 10 mission, Mariner Venus Mercury to Mercury. And so he, um, he and I you know, got to be friends and he said, you know, I need a mission analyst. And he said, you're I said, I don't know anything about mission anal analysis. He said, yeah, but you're really smart. <laughs> you can pick it up. So he hired me. So I went to work on this uh, project to go to Venus and Mercury in 1973 and 1974. And the first day I went into the, the, man, the project, the guy on the project who managed, it, managed this part of the project, and he was the mission design manager. And I said, oh, I'm a mission analyst. What does a mission analyst do? <laughs> and he said, well, it's customary to define your own job. So it turns out, you know, what I ended up doing was going around and one of the, the main thing I did was to talk to uh, scientists and talk to the engineers and kind of interlock, interlock it between the two because the scientists always want more than the engineers can do. So I spent two years figuring out how to balance uh, the science requirements or the in desires versus the engineering capabilities. and I. Finally managed to do that, and we picked the launch date. The optimal launch date was November 3rd, 1973. And so that was, that was my first big accomplishment. I, it was a framed uh, letter saying we've changed our launch date to November 3rd, 1973. So I had that on my office wall for a long time. Um, so went all the way through the project. Then that finished off in 1974. We got got to Mercury, Venus, then Mercury, went around to Mercury three times. And then, um, let's see, what was the next thing? Oh, and then um, I said, you know, I'm really tired of working in mission operations. It's long, long hours, very intense. Uh, and there was a guy who had a section, a section's about 100 people, a section who was looking at uh, non-space problems, you know, like uh, uh, energy and so on. So I went to him and said, Brody, do you have a, do you have an opening, a project opening? And he said, yeah, I've got, I've got this really neat project. So I said, okay. So I turned down the next mission analysis job, which was on Voyager, which ended up going to Venus and, Ur Venus and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, not Pluto. Uh, and it's still flying. There's still two Voyagers flying all this time later. But anyway, so I said, no, I don't want to don't want to be on mission operations again. That's you know, just too taxing. So I'll do this this energy project. So I went over back and talked to the section manager. And he said, oh, well, actually, I don't have a project job, but I have a group supervisor job. Well, that's a line management job. So, you know, you're taking care of people. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a project with a real output and, a, um, and so on. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, it's all I got. <laughs> so at that point I said, well, okay. So then I became the energy, let's see, the civil systems uh, group supervisor. So we had energy, we had uh, uh, medical things, we had uh, uh, police stuff. You know, you name it, as long as it wasn't space, we had it. Well, our job was to figure out things like uh, what can we afford, how many people are interested in having this, and so on. 
And so somebody said, you know, we need to hire an economist. <laughs> and I said, what's an economist? <laughs> and they said, well, go out and find one. I had no idea what an economist was. So I um, uh, squirreled around, squirreled around, and finally found a guy who had just finished his master's degree in economics. And so I got him to come in and give an interview. And one of the things, JPL is a division of Caltech, the California Institute of Technology. Caltech had this whiz bang economics department. So I said, would you guys listen to a, a seminar by this applicant and tell me what you think? So his seminar was on finfish. Now finfish are not shellfish. So finfish are any, any kind of fish that swims like that. And he get, started giving this, this lecture and, and I realized he had not a clue what he was talking about. It was so embarrassing because these Caltech people are just brilliant, you know. And I was going, oh my gosh, what have I done? And so at the end of it, I ran up to the supervisor of this group of economists and said, oh, Charlie, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. I don't want to, you know, I don't know anything about economics. And this other guy in the group who's really an irascible fellow came storming up and Charlie says, that's okay, she's already apologized. <laughs> and so I said, look, I can't do this. I need you guys to help me. So they did. They went out and looked for people and they found two or three, four people, economists, who they thought were acceptable and their standards are very high. And so, uh, well, the first guy we hired was from UCLA and he came up from uh, from Los Angeles and immediately had an allergic reaction and his eyes swelled shut so he went back <laughs> that was it uh, so the second person we got was a guy who had just been in uh, Maine and so he came we hired him and he came out with his family from Maine and when they came out in the summer and you know he had two kids his wife and two kids and when those little kids, you know, hit the summer in California, they just wilted. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, he, he stayed. He stayed for his whole career. And then he was six feet tall and had a beautiful blonde wife. The second economist we hired was six feet tall and had a beautiful blonde wife. And I thought, I've got this down pat. <laughs> you know, this is how you hire economists. The third one was Kachin Terasawa, who was you know, an Asian with a little short Asian wife. So we thought, well, so much for that. But, uh, so that worked out really well. We had economists. And then some of the projects we worked on, we needed uh, a policy analyst. Like, we were doing a national geothermal program plan. We, NASA had been tasked with, this was during 19, the 70s, the big energy crisis in the 70s. NASA had been tasked with uh, coming up with a national energy plan specifically geothermal energy to, you know, produce lots and lots of geothermal energy. So they gave it to NASA and NASA gave it to us, gave it to JPL. And of course the engineers all plunged in and started designing geothermal things. And we said, wait a minute, you know, it's not really a technical problem. There are really a bunch of other issues like, uh, uh, you know, what what about utilities? How do utilities react to these kinds of sporadic things that are located in areas, like geothermal is not in areas where it's close to users. So somebody you have to make the, the power and pipe it. And you know, then in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, using it for uh, heat for industry and things like that, how are they located and so on. So we got into that, so I had these economists. I was the one with the economists. So we started working on that, and then we discovered that, well, a lot of it is really building codes and uh, things like that, and there's really legal issues, so I ended up hiring a policy analyst and a lawyer. <laughs> so this was the strangest group at JPL. It was really odd. And uh, <laughs> so we worked on that for a while, and. Then we got into solar energy and, and all uh, 
what are the kinds of energy? Started working with the, the gas company and with electric companies, found out how utilities work and so on. And so, uh, and we still, we still were getting stuff going with the, uh, you know, the police and the hospitals and so on. So the group got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally I said, this group is, you know, 40 people, it's too big. Can we split it? So we split the group. The section manager said, okay, we'll split the group and give half of it to somebody else and you keep the energy part. I said, okay. So that kept growing and growing. And so finally I said, okay, can I get, can I just give this away to somebody and go work on something else? So we hired somebody else to work on the, to be the group supervisor. So at that point, um, what happened then? Oh yeah, at that point, um, I'd been working with, oh, at that point, I went to a, a friend of mine who was in charge of all the advanced projects at JPL and said, John, I really need to get back in the space business, you know. Okay, I've had enough of this non-space stuff. I came here to work in space. He said, well, he says, all I have is this little study, but it's going to be the next big JPL project. It's going to go to is Mariner, Ju Ju Mariner, Jupiter, Saturn. And I said, okay, that sounds like fun. So I took over this study and we had about, I don't know, $250,000 or something. And we had to design this mission. Well, that was a lot of money in those days. We had to design this mission to go to fly by Jupiter and then use the gravity assist from Jupiter to go to Saturn. Now on Mariner 10, we'd used the, it had been the first gravity assist mission. And we used the, the gravity of uh, Venus to turn the trajectory so we go to Mercury. So I knew something about that. Anyway, so we did this, uh, we designed this mission and uh, came out with, okay, this is the way the mission should work. And a few years later, it became the Cassini mission, which is, uh, was, uh, I think, $2 billion at the time. But it wasn't $2 billion when we did it. So I'm working on that, and I put myself back into put myself into the mission design section, and I said, you know, I don't really want to be in management. I just want to do this do this work. So I'll put myself in the in a group, which is this like ten people. So I put myself in this group, and the group supervisor was nowhere near as senior as I was, and he was really. I said, don't worry about it, Ron. I'll just, I'll work for you and everything will be fine. <laughs> so uh, at that point, the section manager said, what are you doing in here in this group? I want a deputy section manager. So he grabbed me and brought me up to be the deputy section manager. Well, that meant that he got to go do all the fun stuff. And I ended up running the section, you know, working with the, the marital problems and then and the raises and the parking problems and all these things that a line manager has to do. And so then he went off and became a, a mission design manager for a mission to Venus and left me with this, this uh, section. So I said, you know, this is not really what I want to do. So I started scouting around and it turned out that a fr another friend of mine uh, was running a little advanced study for the space station which in 1980 was, you know, just an idea. And so I said, gee, Al, can I help you out with this space station? So I ended up working on the space station and, and uh, then he went off and did something else and I ended up with the, the group that dealt with the space station. In the meantime, uh, somebody else had an autonomous systems project for the, for the Air Force so I worked on that for a while, got, uh, got found out about how to fly robotic systems and so on. And uh, ended up, the space station job lasted about four years and what we found out was that, that nobody wanted the, the space station and all the manned programs are, are owned by the manned centers, namely uh, Johnson Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, and Marshall Space Center. And they didn't want, you know, they were going to be in charge. And so here JPL is in there trying to tell them how to, how to do things. And they didn't like that at all. 
And in fact, uh, JPL is in an odd position because it's the only NASA center that's a contractor. The rest of them are civil service. But we work for Caltech mm -hmm. under contract to NASA. So we're this, as one, as one of the Marshall guys says, you guys are neither fish nor fowl. <laughs> and so we were always, you know, taking flack from these people. Um, and finally, about 1984, I realized it just, you know, was not really going to work out. So at that point, what did I do then? I think at that point I got back in. Oh, before then, I had been. I forgot. I left out. I'd been the uh, division manager for energy. So my job was to. It was not to manage anything really, but to be staff to the division manager for energy issues. So I did that for a while, and in the in the meantime. That was in the 70s, because we're still having these big energy problems. In the 70s, and I got married, and I had my daughter. And so my, my division manager, uh, at that point, I, you know, I said, gee, I'd really like to have done enough of this. I'd really like to have a good, responsible job. And, uh, but I couldn't get one. So I asked my, uh, I asked my friend, who was... Somehow or other, he was, he was the group supervisor. Anyway, I can't remember all of the details, but he finally went to the division manager and said, you know, why can't Donna get a responsible job? And he said, well, she's now fulfilled as a mother. <laughs> so I had to go and say, look, I'm not fulfilled as a mother. Yes, I like being a mother. And motherhood is very important, but I still want to have a responsible job. So they ended up you know, giving me a responsible job. Um, anyway, so then, let's see, that was the 80s, and then, oh, and then the, um, they, oh, my boss, who at that time was the, was what's called an ALD, an assistant laboratory director, and he was my boss for the space station program. And he said, well, you know, I need somebody to run the robotics technology program, automation and robotics. And I said, I don't know anything about that. He said, that's okay. He said, the people who do know something about it don't want that job. They just want to do research and development. Uh, would you try it? <laughs> so I said, okay. So I took some classes in robotics and I, you know, read up on it and all that sort of stuff. And took over that job and did, uh, ran the robotics and automation program for several years. And one of the big parts of that was rovers, planetary rovers. And so uh, along came, let's see, oh, they, so they were doing, oh, there were so doing a, lot of, a lot of Mars rover sample return studies being done. And it was going to be precursors to human Mars exploration. So, um, and the, the rovers were going to go to Mars and pick up samples and deliver them to uh, a uh, rocket. The rocket was going to take off and fly back to Earth and bring the samples back to Earth. And then that would tell us something about where to send the people. So the, the, that project with the rover and the lander and the Earth return vehicle and all that was, was ending up going to cost about six billion dollars. And we were involved in studies to look at the whole manned uh, program. And that was so expensive, it was about 400 billion. That was so expensive that NASA would not tell Congress what they expected the cost to be. And uh, so Congress said, this is going to be way more than we can afford. So they canceled all the Mars exploration, including the Mars rover program, Mars rover sample return. Well, I was running the, the rover part of Mars rover sample return, and so basically I was out of money. And uh, so once again, <laughs> the story of my life, things are canceled and I'm out of money. Um, but in the meantime, the uh, technology program was going along, and as part of the during that, I got 
somehow all tangled up with putting together all of the uh, NASA centers to create a Mars uh, systems engineering handbook, which was not easy because NASA centers don't like to work together. But we, we did that. And then we put together a, uh, oh, and then we were asked to do a plan for uh, uh, man management training, program project, project management training. And we did that and got in big trouble because the, the things we were suggesting that needed to be done, the center directors and the head of NASA really didn't want to hear. So I went in and made a presentation at one point and, and these guys started yelling at me. And they yelled at me for about an hour. And because I, I said, well, you know, you need to do things like uh, have the project managers be have their salaries not determined by the center directors because they're going to push work to the centers even when it's not appropriate uh, because the the uh, centers don't want to let go of control of their uh, so anyway they were yelling at me and yelling at me and finally uh, the guy who was kind of our sponsor at, at headquarters said well do you not want us to uh, to care to, to do it, go on with this. This was the first of three reports, and so the the head of NASA said, "Well, we really can't uh, can't cut you off because that would really look bad." <laughs> so, uh, but just so carry on, but just only address the training issues and so on. So we ended up, you know, with this namby pamby report. But after this first thing, this girl woman comes up, and there was only one other woman in the place. This woman comes up to me and she says, how could you live with being yelled at by all those people? And I said, ah, I'm from JPL, I've been yelled at by experts. <laughs> and it's true, but JPL does reviews. They really do reviews. Hmm. So at that point, um, there was um, life return to the rover program in the form of a little tiny uh, in-house sponsored project for $25 million to build a small rover because it was clear that nobody was going to be able to afford a big rover so and there were some people working on technology for small rovers so the uh, one of the managers at JPL came up with sorry 2.5 million not 25 2.5 million dollars to pay for developing this little rover up to a demonstration. So that that went on and they were said, well, we're going to try to carry this on now to a real project. And so they advertised for a project manager and I applied and uh, got the job. So my job was basically to go to headquarters and sell them on the idea of spending 10 times as much money as they'd ever spent on a flight project, on a real project, because it was clear that unless we flew a rover, we were never going to get to fly a rover, because nobody would ever believe. And so after much travail, uh, I finally, finally ended up getting the resources for that and building this little rover, which became Sojourner, which landed on Mars in 1997. And um, so the, the Managing Martian book is full of that. Okay, so. Pathfinder landed on Mars in 1997. Right. Um, and interestingly enough, the technology it used to land was this blunt sphere cone technology that I'd worked on back in the 60s. It all comes back around. <laughs> it does. It all comes back around. And the, um, so anyway, the little rover, we landed and the little rover gets off and crawls around and is beloved by everybody. And we had, we set the new record for the internet in terms of hits. There was something like 45 million hits. And, you know, they say the, the uh, Roosevelt's Pearl Harbor ad ad address was the defining moment for radio and landing on the moon was the defining moment for television and Pathfinder landing on Mars was the defining moment for the internet. And so uh, uh, Pathfinder landed for, uh, lasted for uh, about 90 days, about three months, and even though it was only supposed to, you know, technically, uh, contractually, supposed to last for a month, I think. And the rover was contractually only supposed to last for a week, 
but it lived longer than the lander did. But then finally, when the lander died, because the lander, the rover had, uh, uh, could, could, had, uh, it could sleep during the day, I mean, sorry, sleep at night, and then when the sun came up, it could use the energy from the sun to, to do its thing. And it had a primary battery, like a flashlight battery, to run on at night. Uh, but it also had little, little uh, radioactive heater units, so it could stay, it could stay warm at night. And uh, the lander was too big to have these little radioactive heater units, so it would get cold unless it, it had batteries that could run at night, but it had rechargeable batteries. Well, the batteries just ran down after three months, and so then it, you know, then it died. And the, the, the rover was so small, about the size of a microwave oven, so small that it couldn't communicate, didn't have enough power to communicate all the way back to the Earth. So the rover would talk to the lander, the lander would talk to the Earth, and then you'd send commands to the rover through the lander. And so when the lander died, then the rover could not be heard from. Um, and so the, we had the rover programmed to, if she lost contact with the, uh, with the earth, to, to go around the lander going, hello, hello. <coughs> and finally, if she didn't hear from us, and she'd get stuck on a rock or something like that. And so, uh, <coughs> so we have this image of the, the little rover going around the lander, you know, and finally getting... It, if she tipped too much, she was programmed to stop and just call for help, but help would never come, so it's very sad. <coughs> but you must have been very proud. Oh, yeah. The day yeah. of landing. Yeah. Well, I had actually um, turned over the management of the rover in 1994. We started in 92. In 94, uh, I was kicked upstairs to manage the whole Mars exploration program. That is, uh, the Pathfinder, Mars Global Surveyor, and, and all the following missions. And so, um, the uh, rover was managed at that point by a guy named Jake Matijevich, who uh, was much better suited than I was in one way, is that I was just terrible at doing the bookkeeping. Just terrible. And Jake is a PhD in math, and he could just do it like that. <laughs> I mean, I would spend hours and hours trying to make the numbers work out, and it was just terrible. And we couldn't afford to have, you know, staff who would do that. So I had to do it myself. It was, it was a very small, small group of people, 30 people max at the, at the most. Uh, but I was very proud of the rover, and I was very proud of the lander, and then Mars Global Surveyor was successful to some extent. It, it ended up, uh, it was an orbiter of Mars, and just recently died. Uh, went orbiting Mars for a long time, but it had, when it launched, it had a broken solar panel. And so in, it's kind of a long story, but anyway, because of this broken solar panel, it took an extra year to get into the right orbit. And then that affected the 298 missions, which failed. <clears throat> and so after, and in 98, we've been, we've been telling headquarters that there wasn't enough money for what they wanted to do. And they kept sending more and more requirements, you know, and no money. And uh, the problem is that headquarters, the headquarters managers were all scientists. They did not understand engineering. They didn't understand the engineering issues at all. And they didn't want to understand the engineering issues. And, you know, you, people are just whining. And so we kept telling them, you know, the disaster was going to ensue. And bef so before the launch, I, I retired. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was kind of sad to do it, but I didn't want to be—I didn't want to be associated with it. So, uh, sure enough, both the lander and the orbiter failed, and then they came to their senses and put more money because the next two years launches to Mars are every 26 months, and so the next one was 2001, and they planned to send 
two more, Rover and Lander. So finally they came to their senses and put all the money into the, to the orbiter. We we're going to send an orbiter and a lander. Put all the money into the orbiter and uh, it worked fine. So it's still there, Mars Odyssey, still there. And since then they've had uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is much bigger and does can see tiny little things on the surface, and can see something the size of a person on the surface of Mars. And, and so it's going gangbusters now. <clears throat> and then the next one in the series, just to finish up, is something called Curiosity, which is a curiosity, all right. Oh, I, now in 2003, before the Reconnaissance Orbiter, there were two much bigger rovers named Spirit and Opportunity. And uh, they're still up there. Spirit is probably dead, but Opportunity is still taking an opportunity to go. Uh, and then the next one is going to be Curiosity, which launches next year. And it's enormous. It's the size of a car uh, and carries gazillions of instruments and is badly cost overrun. Just, you know, it's billions of dollars. I forget exactly how much. So it, once it went from, you know, this, these tiny little modest things up to... <laughs> Well, after you retired from JPL, you ended up back in Oklahoma? Right. So, uh, because when I was on the, uh, when I was the Mars Exploration Program Manager, I sort of did all the publicity stuff for Pathfinder, which was extensive. And uh, so Norm Haynes, who was my boss, and I ended up, doing the TV and all that stuff so that it wouldn't bother the people actually doing the work. So I ended up on television a lot and spent a lot of time on CNN, the whole day of the, the mission, the, the whole day of the landing on CNN. It got a lot of exposure. And so I ended up with a, a big uh, speaking contract, lots of speaking assignments, uh, the uh, I'd written a book called Managing Creativity that uh, just didn't sell, and so I got this agent who sent me a letter saying, uh, "How would you write like to write a book?" And I said, "I did," and you turned it down. <laughs> she said, "Send it back." <laughs> so I sent it back, and she shopped it around. Well, nobody wanted it, but they wanted an, one company, Broadway Books, wanted an autobiography. So they said, "Okay, write this autobiography." So. Uh, I did, but they insisted I have a co-writer, and so it ended up that that was not a, entirely a re really great relationship. And so the book I wanted the book to be a lot more management, and she wanted the book to be a lot more touchy feely, and she was not particularly worried about accuracy, <laughs> and I was very worried about accuracy, and so it was not a super comfortable relationship. But we did get it written, and I got a terrific advance for it which they will never, ever make back. Uh, poor things. <clears throat> but it's their business. Uh, so anyway, so I wrote the book, and in the meantime, I was so disgusted with the management issues on the Mars program that I wrote this book called Managing Creativity, which is about how to really manage. And uh, that was what I was trying to get published, and it, nobody was interested in it. And it wasn't really all that good either, so, but I was just so furious, I sat down and wrote it in like a month. <laughs> so it, um, uh, so I did that, and then I did a lot of speaking, and my daughter had graduated from, uh, from college. She went to Scripps College for Women in Claremont, Claremont. and uh, uh, when she graduated, I thought, you know, I don't really have to stay here anymore. She's going to go off to grad school somewhere else. So I, uh, and I got this offer from the University of Oklahoma to be an assistant dean of engineering. So I said, fine. So I sold the house, went back to Oklahoma. And my, my daughter, I just sent her an email because she and her, her fiance were on a grand tour of Europe at the time. So I sent him an email saying I sold the house. And she was totally upset. You know, how could you sell our house, the house I grew up in, and so on. And uh, she was never going to live there. And so she spent, her, her, her fiancé sent me an email said, she spent the night sobbing on the Paris subway. 
because I sold her house. But I made a great profit on it, so I put that, invested that, and um, that did rather well. So then I was four years at the University of Oklahoma doing uh, strategic planning and uh, <clears throat> also uh, teaching. Taught the man my managing creativity course for four years, four times a year. And uh, then, oh, then they, they got their budget cut. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> I see a trend. The trend. So the budget was cut, and they just couldn't afford to have an assistant dean, and I couldn't afford to live on a half salary. So um, I said, well, what the heck, if I'm going to be broke, I might as well be broke in Seattle, which is where my daughter was at that time, going to, uh, going to graduate school. So I um, moved to Seattle, and uh, well, oh, when I was there, one this woman had asked me to be on the board of uh, a new museum they were starting up called the Science Fiction Museum, and so then they decided they really needed a director for the Science Fiction Museum, and so they asked me if I would do that. So I said, well, okay. So I ended up doing that for. 10 months or so, just to get it started, get it kicked off. And then I had some health problems, so I was kind of out of things for several years. Uh, still did a little speaking and so on in Seattle. But then uh, my, uh, good luck, my son-in-law, by that time my daughter and son-in-law had gotten married and they'd had a, a baby, and uh, they, uh, <laughs> He was an investor, and he worked for, for Bill Gates uh, to invest Bill's pocket change. Uh, not Didn't work for Microsoft, but worked directly for a little group that worked directly for Bill, investing his money that went in to support the foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he, he and his boss had sort of agreed that it was time for him to move on. And so he got this offer in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to work for the, as a chief investment officer for the George Kaiser Family Foundation. <laughs> and Robert and Laura had always sworn, they're both West Coast kids. Uh, Robert's from the Seattle area and Laura, of course, from LA. Never, never moved to the middle of the country. Oklahoma, wow, ridiculous, why should we move there? But this offer was too good to be refused. So they moved here and I said, hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> so my partner and I moved here and, and uh, bought a house, stayed in an apartment downtown for several months and then bought this house and uh, on Swan Lake where we enjoy the swans. And uh, You're back in Oklahoma. Back in Oklahoma in a different part of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. but it's, it's nice to be nice to be back. Well, well what does Oklahoma mean to you? Well, it's, you know, it's my place. It's, uh, I like the people. Um, I can put up with the environment. <laughs> you know, I don't like the summers. Of course, the summers are awful. Uh, and interestingly enough, the winters never used to have snow. But we've, the last few years, we've just Tough. been snowed in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, for, fortunately, George, my partner, uh, has lived in places like, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which have lots of snow, so he's sort of used to it, but I'm not, not used to it. Seattle had some snow, but uh, Oklahoma, I expected, you know, maybe one small snow a year, but the last two years have just been insane. So um, we're thinking about the next time we hear it's going to snow, we're going to rent a four-wheel drive vehicle because we're housebound. We can't, mm -hmm. We've got these little cars. We can't get out of the get out of the house. So um, I haven't really found a whole lot to do. I'm on the on boards of advisors of the College of Engineering, and and um, you know people are always asking me to give speeches and things like that. So I do that, uh, but I haven't. I haven't been terribly busy, so. Um, well, in in two thousand three, and you've received many many awards and honors through the years. Yeah. Um, but in two thousand three, you were inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. What what was going through your mind when you got the phone call? Oh, I just how neat! 
it was uh, just a real honor. Um, I didn't know there was an Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. I knew there was an Oklahoma mm -hmm. Hall of Fame, but uh, I had no idea there was an Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. And so it was, uh, it was great to be inducted and then meet the other women uh, who were very cool. Uh, there's a lot of very cool women in this state that nobody knows about. Uh, but also, I've gotten a little involved in politics. I campaigned for Drew Edmondson mm -hmm. against Jerry Askins, and I campaigned for Jerry Askins against Mary <laughs> Fallon. <laughs> I, I'm the kiss of death for, <laughs> for people <laughs> who are running for office. Um, but uh, so I've, done, I've never gotten involved in politics before. Hmm. Although it was interesting, when I went to Seattle, I went from Oklahoma, which is the reddest state in the Union, to a little precinct in Seattle that's the most liberal precinct in Washington, <laughs> maybe in the United States, just incredibly liberal. And it was quite a contrast. Well, what advice would you give to those young girls, maybe growing up in small Oklahoma towns, maybe not, maybe growing up in big cities and other places in the United States that have their eye to the sky and want to get involved in science, what, what would you tell them? Oh, I would tell them, you know, just do what your heart tells you to do. One of the things I teach in my course is following your passion. Is number one, finding out what your passion is, and number two, figuring out how to follow it. I was uh, teaching a class at OU for freshman women in um, career planning. And it was interesting, one girl in the class, um, and at the end of the class they had to give up and give a, a final report. And this girl said, you know, my uh, parents wanted me to be a doctor. So I was enrolled in pre-med, and um, I just really didn't care for it. What I really did wanted to do was major in accounting because my favorite thing to do was my parents' income tax return. I said, can I adopt you? <laughs> and she was so, she was practically teary about it. She said, because her parents really wanted her to be a doctor and she didn't want to be a doctor, she wanted to be an accountant, which, which I find strange, but she really meant it. And she said, and I prayed about it. I mean, she was really serious and finally decided, I think partly on the basis of this class, to do what, what her heart told her to do. And I thought that was just wonderful. Well, uh, you know, I've gone through your book and, and there's, a, there's a chapter in there that it, it brings up a very good question. So, so what do you do after you've been to Mars? Oh. Well, that was, uh, that was, that's almost, that's been a difficulty. <laughs> um, I've done so many things since I uh, left JPL, and I'm involved in all sorts of volunteer activities and all sorts of, you know, I've run a science fiction museum, and I've been an assistant dean of engineering, and I've taught engineering classes, and I've been on advisory boards, and, and... Uh, so I, what's next? Well, I don't know. I haven't found anything as intriguing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that there is anything as intriguing as, as landing on Mars for the first time. But, um, you know, it's, it's really great because my grandson is nearly four and he's terrific. My daughter finished her PhD after nine years of agony. Uh, and so now she's trying to figure out what to do when she grows up. Uh, she's on the board of Planned Parenthood right now, so that gives her something to do. Um, my son-in-law is just working so hard that he's out of the country a third of the time. In uh, India and Australia and Ireland and places like that. Um, I take, uh, George and I have started to go on cruises with some old friends of mine. We went to Alaska last year and this year we're going on a transatlantic cruise to Europe. And so I've sort of decided, you know, it's, I put all this money away to retire on, and it would be okay to spend some of it on retirement kinds of things. Because uh, you figure, gee, in 10 years I'll be 80. <laughs> and 
I don't know how much longer I'm going to be, you know, doing things like cruises and things. And I can't really do much skiing anymore, and I can't really do much hiking anymore. And and so it's kind of down to, you know, doing old folks stuff. And so the thing is just to do old folks stuff that's fun with uh, as much as possible with, with friends. And so that's kind of what we're doing right now. Well, that sounds pretty good. Well, and, I'll tr and I'm also joined the gym, and I'm working out, trying to get in shape, and I broke my leg. <laughs> and the thing to do is to not break my leg anymore. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, as we, we come to a close, is there is there anybody you'd like to mention or make note of that is, has really played a really big role in, in your career and your life along the way? Well, interestingly enough, um, I had no role models whatsoever. Uh, Wonder Woman and Mary Marvel were my two role models when I was a little kid. Uh, there were, I've always been the first woman to do anything that I've done. So uh, I was the only woman in my classes. I wasn't the first, but I was the only woman in my classes at OU. I was the only woman in my graduate school classes. Uh, out of When I got to JPL, I was the only female engineer out of about 2,000 engineers. And so what I've ended up being is a role model to everybody else but not having a whole lot of role models myself. I have a lot of friends. Um, and when, when this one woman I mentioned that uh, got me into my sorority because she was a pilot, I mean, we're still great friends and she was certainly a role model for, hey, women can be pilots too and things like that. Um, and uh, I'm also a member of the Women, women in Technology International Hall of Fame. And, uh, there's, you know, brilliant, spectacular women in that. I mean, and being in these uh, women's uh, women's uh, groups that give you, you know, role models because they're such wonderful people, and you can kind of go, "Ooh, wow, <laughs> these are really great." So, so that's good. But I, I think uh, now there are about 20% of engineering students are women. Uh, and some schools have a lot more, have all, up to 50%. Some schools, aerospace engineering, unfortunately, have fewer. Computer science has practically none. Um, so it's, it, you know, being, I like being a role model. Like I'm going to be giving a speech at, for the Society of Women Engineers uh, regional uh, event in, in, uh, at TU next year. Uh, so I, I like doing that. Um, I like, you know, being a role model myself, and uh, that's that's important. And so I guess just keep doing that, and raising my grandson, helping raise my grandson. He's a great kid. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't spoken about today? Oh gosh, I've been talking steadily. Uh, no. I think one of the things that, that I've learned is, you know, being close to my family is very important. Mm -hmm. I only have one daughter, one child, and uh, I've been following her around the country. And it's really great because, like, the, I get along really well with my son-in-law. He's a super guy. And I get along really well with my daughter. And so just being able to, like, we have brunch once a month at the Summit Club. And uh, with the, bring the little boy along, and, and uh, he brings his transformers along, <laughs> things like that. So babysitting with him, and uh, they're now thinking about having another one. So I'll have being being grandma is uh, very fulfilling. And so you go through these stages of life uh, where you you can't do things you used to do. But, uh, but there are other things to do, and you just have to figure out, uh, okay, what, what can I get fulfillment out of if I can't keep sailing and skiing and so on? And, uh, and I, I've found quite a few things to be having a partner. I haven't had a partner in years and years, and you know, he's, he's terrific. He's uh, really helping a lot with my broken leg. <laughs> He drives me around. 
so it uh, it's really nice having a companion. Well, good, and and we're glad to have you back in Oklahoma, of course. I'm glad to be back in Oklahoma now. I hope my son-in-law is going to keep this, you know, stay with this job for a while. They're talking about at least five years, so I'm hoping I can talk him into staying longer than that. But uh, you know, he's going to go where he can get the best job. So. And we'll probably follow them along. But I hope it's in Oklahoma. I'll, I'll continue to have ties to Oklahoma. I mean, I'll continue to be on advisory boards and things like that. But, gee, I've been on the College of Engineering advisory board for for 10 years now. It's about time to let somebody else do it. Well, as we, we come to a close, I, I do have a question for you. What do you think is the future uh, of our space program? <sighs> Very good question. Um, the, the, the thing is that the Bush administration tried to go way too far. They, well, the original George Bush, the first George the first, uh, got up and made this pronouncement that said, we're gonna go to the moon and Mars, the moon and then back to Mars with people. Uh, and it was clear that there was never NASA's budget to do that. NASA has a problem because when when the Apollo program happened back in the 50s and in the 60s, um, the budget went and all these contractors went Now there's this huge organization that has to be fed. And you know, you try to cancel anything and the 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 congressmen just go berserk because of the jobs. So NASA has become this big jobs program. Um, I'm very encouraged by the progress that's being made by the private space companies, like Elon Musk has uh, the Falcon, and it's it's now shot off a couple of times, and and uh, you know people are starting to have uh, have success. These small companies, and NASA has some money going into uh, these small companies and they're getting investment dollars and things like that and so before maybe the next 10 years we're gonna have private space stuff and that's really good that'll get supported by you know capital funding um, and but but NASA is such a jobs program it's very hard to cancel anything or to squeeze things down into what can actually be afforded. So poor NASA is getting bombarded all the time with you've got to do this and this and this and this and this and they just don't have the money. So it's it's a real problem and I think there'll be a transition period when we'll be uh, transitioning to more a lot more private enterprise. In the meantime the Chinese are going gangbusters uh, they're going to have a space station in a couple of years. They're going to, you know, they they can spend money any way they want because of, of the kind of government they have. And uh, they certainly have a lot of money, mm -hmm. ours. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think the the Chinese and uh, are going to be, and maybe the Indians, the Indians are starting to get into it too, I mean, they've got billions and billions of people, and they're very smart. And if you think about, if you have two billion people and you have the top 10 percent, you know that's 200 million very smart people. And U.S. we have 350 million, and the top 10 percent is 3.5 million smart people. And on top of that, I think our biggest problem is that that we're simply not teaching. We're not educating our kids. It's a huge problem. And it's one of the things we work real hard on at, at OU uh, is trying to support OU in you know, getting kids to go into engineering and into the hard sciences as opposed to history, sorry. Right, oh, it's, it's true. <laughs> no, history's important. Sure. I mean, if those who don't know it are condemned to repeat it. Mm -hmm. It's very important. But uh, you can't build an economy on historians. You need to build an economy on, sci on science and technology, and we don't have enough of it. So I'm very concerned about that, and um, 
In the meantime, the Chinese and the Indians are educating all these people like mad. Um, and we, for instance, can't get graduate students. Uh, we can get graduate students, but they're all foreigners. And they can't work on classified projects, for example, which is where an awful lot of the money is. I mean, the, the military program has far more money than NASA does. You know, NASA has 16 billion, let's say. The military has 300 billion, 400 billion, something like that. And so the military can just do so much more than we can. And for Oklahoma to be able to get a piece of the action is really hard if all we have are Chinese and Indian graduate students. And uh, you need graduate students to do the work so the professors can do research. And it's, it's, a, it's a terrible problem. So I worry about uh, our economic capabilities, I mean our being the mm -hmm. whole country. And uh, it, uh, is, the space program is just part of it. And the space program has to prove that it's good for something. Right now, it's a you know, jobs program. Mm -hmm. And you can't sustain that. You can't hold together on just creating government jobs. You have to be able to create private jobs. And so it's, um, it's tricky. <sighs> anyway, the answer is I don't know. Yeah. Long answer. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It will be. Mm-hmm. Well, again, thank you for, for sitting down with us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you.